One, two, three, four. Up, up. One, two, three, four. Up, up. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Information. Yes. Information. Yes. I mean, you want to Welcome back from lunch, everyone. I uh, hope you guys had a, a good continuing conversation while you were uh, eating. I think that's a uh, one of the most important things about an event like this is you know, having those discussions, not just based on what's going on in the session, but uh, based on some, some of the other things that are going on that we didn't program. And Suzanne's gonna talk a, a little bit about that in a second. I got one other uh, reminder. We have a map out in the lobby and uh, grab one of those push pins and uh, stick it in that map where you are. We, we wanna build a picture of where all the lion sites are in, a, you know, uh, on a physical map. So, uh, Suzanne, you want to talk a little bit about the, the other programming? So far, I think the Northeast is winning. So if you're from other part of the country, put that pin up. Uh, welcome back. Hope you had enough to eat. Um, unconference. Have any of you done an unconference before? Yay. Okay, so basically we know that there's no way that we covered every important topic. Um, so we are hoping with your good creative ideas, and there are already a whole bunch of them posted on the whiteboard out here, um, that you might submit a few more. So we have post-it notes out. The idea is for you to think about what you see on the program, what we've already offered up. And if you see a hole that you really think is something we need to fill, then go ahead and make a pitch. Remember, you're going to be making a pitch to everyone else who's looking at that board. So go ahead and make the pitch. Put it on the... Uh, whiteboard and then we're going to give you a deadline because we all need a deadline right so tonight before you leave so maybe after you've even had a few drinks at the reception or before you've had the drinks either way uh, get your idea up there that's totally fine if you already see some ideas you like up there and you don't want to offer any more but we wanted everyone to have a chance so why don't we just say the deadline is tonight at 7 30 um, and then tomorrow morning we'll kind of sort through them and then we'll make an announcement about which three will be considered. We have breakout sessions tomorrow afternoon, so there'll be time for each of those three different time slots for one of those ideas, each of the time periods to go. So we'll be looking for three ideas. All right, thanks. It's my pleasure to introduce our lawyer who will not be giving us legal advice. You see the disclaimer down there. Jeffrey Cossum. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure we'll be sharing really good information with us, just not legal advice. <laughs> so thank you so much for having me. Um, so I do have to repeat this disclaimer. Uh, the views expressed only are my own. This isn't legal advice. 
uh, and we don't have an attorney client privilege uh, based on this presentation so please don't come up to me and share something that might be held against you later because uh, it would not be privileged. So we've gotten that out of, out of the way. Um, my name is Jeff Kossif and I am counsel at Potomac Law Group. I work in media law, privacy law, cybersecurity law. My passion for media law and the First Amendment really came from my previous career. Um, like I'm sure many of you, I worked for a very large news outlet. I worked for the Oregonian newspaper in Portland. I was a technology reporter there, and then I covered Congress for them. I went to law school at night while I covered Congress. Um, I, like many of you, maybe saw the writing on the wall for large metropolitan newspapers. Uh, you all are doing brave and amazing things. I went to law school. Uh, but <laughs> not, nonetheless, uh, one of the reasons I did that was because when I was at the Oregonian, I had the fortune we were part of the Newhouse chain of papers. And Newhouse actually literally owned its own law firm. So we had some amazing lawyers who I can say got me out of situations that I never wanted to be in. I had letters sent to me using the phrase Texas Penal Code. I do not want my name associated with the Texas Penal Code. I'm from New Jersey. Um, but they, they really saved me. And that's really what I view my role when I um, work with and give information to uh, news outlets of all sizes is helping to solve problems. Uh, my philosophy is always to get to publish. Uh, I know many of you may have worked with lawyers over the, over the years who say, let's try not to publish. We're going to deny the ability to publish. We're going to say no. I think that's a bad approach. Um, I also think it's a bad approach to guarantee that you will never get sued. Uh, no lawyer can ever tell you that no matter what they do, prevent lawsuits, people sue over all kinds of crazy things. The best thing that you can do is reduce the risk of a successful lawsuit. Uh, I'm going to talk about defamation today, but I do want to say there are a lot of legal concerns that uh, new, especially local online news outlets should be aware of. Uh, one is incorporation. Please, if any of you, and this isn't legal advice, but I will say if any of you are not registered as an LLC or some other similar form that shields your personal assets, please do so. Uh, we'll talk about uh, libel verdicts, but the average libel ver verdict is $2.8 million. Uh, you do not want your house to be subject to that. You don't want your 401k to be subject to that. So that's one issue, copyright. Uh, always be aware of what you're publishing. Uh, don't get things off the web unless you know for a fact that it's Creative Commons or that you have a license. The damages can be 150,000 per image that you publish. Privacy and, and cybersecurity, this is a big deal for all of you. Privacy, make sure you abide by the policy you have on your website. If you don't have a policy on your website, please do have one on your website, but make sure you abide by it. And cybersecurity, um, this is really a new one, unfortunately, you're all among the biggest targets of foreign actors now. This wasn't always the case, uh, but media outlets, large and small, are being targeted both to get your confidential information, including your sources, and also to even possibly alter and deface your websites, your social media. So uh, you do, unfortunately, have to be careful about that, and there are some legal risks. Uh, but I'm going to move on today to talk about just a few tips on how to reduce the risk of defamation, because that's really one of, still one of the largest legal risks that you all face. Uh, I'm gonna go through it somewhat quickly just so I can have time for questions, and I'll be around after if you have any specific questions. Um, so in my time advising TV stations, websites, newspapers, uh, there's, I see a lot of in my opinions and columns and allegedly's, which is great. I mean, that it's great to say allegedly if it really is alleged for journalism ethics. It's not gonna shield you from lawsuits. Uh, if you say that, you know, the TV state, if you're writing a news report that says the TV station alleged that person A murdered person B, you're just as liable for that statement as the TV station is. Uh, there's also something that's true in First Amendment law that says matters of opinion and not fact cannot be the subject of a defamation lawsuit. And that's true. So if you say, uh, that was the worst restaurant I've ever eaten in, that's a matter of opinion. 
but you can't say, in my opinion, that restaurant use, uses this specific ingredient when it doesn't. So you can't couch it like that. Uh, so just always be aware of that, um, and allegedly just isn't enough. Again, good, good to use it, but it's not gonna be sufficient. Uh, for all of you, I'm sure you're, you have a lot of discussions about whether to allow user comments. Uh, is, is Arlington now here? Uh, uh, oh, he is, okay. Well, uh, I, I live in Arlington, Virginia. I love Arl now. It actually has replaced, its news, local news reporting has replaced the Washington Post in my household. Uh, it's amazing. And uh, I, so, so I love it. Uh, the, their comments, on the other hand, uh, their, their user comments, uh, I live in a particular neighborhood that the users really like to uh, make, make comments about some of our residents uh, that s sometimes border on factual inaccuracies. But what I can tell Scott and Arlington now is they are shielded under federal law for any of the comments that the users are making because there's a federal law called Section 230 that says interactive computer services like websites cannot be held responsible for third-party content that's provided by another party. So that's a good thing. Uh, so you all make judgments. I mean, again, I see, journalistically, I see both sides of the argument as to whether to have user comments. From a legal perspective, if you're just providing the forum and you're not doing anything to encourage or say, please post nasty things about Jeff's neighborhood, um, you're not going to be held legally responsible. And you can even delete some of those comments and not all of them and still remain totally immune from lawsuits. So that's a good thing. And that's been like that for 20 years because of this statute that Congress passed. Unfortunately, Congress, has start, Congress and the courts have started to really look at this immunity. Uh, some of you may have heard of Backpage.com, which is a, an online classified site that essentially has um, been accused of facilitating sex trafficking of minors, uh, ads that people place. And that has uh, put a whole lot of criticism on Section 230 because Backpage has been sued by the victims and the lawsuit's dismissed because the courts say it's uh, third-party content. So I just flag that to say that yes, for 20 years you've had very good immunity for user content but that may be changing and it actually is a little bit already. So just um, be aware of that and uh, be careful. But uh, if you're just being a neutral platform for these user comments, you're probably still gonna be okay for now. My, yep. Yeah, so on the general rule would be, and I don't know the facts of that case, but the general rule, if the person's just the moderator, then there's, they're not gonna be held responsible. However, if they said post comments about this person and post lies about this person, things like that, that's actually a gray area. Some courts would say yes, they will be liable, others would say no, um, but it, it there, Generally, there still would be immunity, but that's what's causing Congress to really look at this a little more. Uh, and again, the United States is the only country in the world that has this immunity. Uh, no other place has it. Uh, my third tip is just whenever you can, please rely on public documents. I know you can't always, and I know that oftentimes that's not where the good stories are. I get it. But if you have a choice of relying on an interview with a witness or a secondhand witness or relying on a police report or a court filing, rely on that document. Almost every jurisdiction has something called the uh, fair report privilege, which means if you give a fair and accurate report of an official document, and each state has a different definition as to what that means, then you actually either have complete or very strong immunity from lawsuits. Uh, so th that's, that's one of the strongest protections, so the case would be dismissed really quickly before you even um, would face any significant legal expenses. Uh, this is a tip I learned over the years, both 
as a lawyer and a journalist, uh, yes, your investigative reports need to be vetted very thoroughly. So if you're doing this big year-long project where you have a number of reporters and a lot of room for error, you need to be careful about that. But I've probably seen more strong defamation lawsuits come from the three-paragraph news brief about the police report because they might put the wrong middle initial of someone who was arrested for a DUI and there might be someone with that full name with the wrong middle initial in the community. They're a private figure. They've got a darn good lawsuit against you. So be careful. And I mean, that's just basically good journalism. That's, um, that, I mean, th th it's nothing special about that, but just please, I know that there's a lot, frankly, I, I haven't been a journalist since 2007, so I know things have changed in terms of having to post things. The Oregonian didn't even have a blog at the time. Uh, but, I, but even with all that time pressure, you've got to be really careful to make sure you get those things right. Yep. Um, I have a question. So Can I? Wait, wait, wait. Don't talk without a mic. You want people? So uh, one of the things that I've had issues with is, is my district attorney's office writes criminal complaints off of police reports, but we don't have access to the police reports unless we're constantly um, open records requesting them. So I've been writing off of the criminal complaints, and then what's been happening is, is people will say, well, your story is wrong when I actually find out that the criminal complaint was wrong. And this has happened numerous times, and I've talked to the district attorney, and she said to me, and I quote, Denise, I have no obligation to tell the truth. I'm actually showing probable cause. So that's a different type of a situation. I sometimes, I oftentimes don't know what I don't know when I'm running off of criminal complaints, and I've caught several issues with regards to this, and I'm not sure what I'm liable for but also in trying to understand and navigate that relationship a little bit too. Yeah, so that's actually a problem in a lot of jurisdictions. Uh, and it really would depend on how the fair report privilege is drafted, how the law is drafted in your state. So you'd really have to look at the specifics of what, what you would be, whether a criminal complaint is covered by the fair report privilege. And in some states it is, in some states it's not. And, but if it's not, then you could face liability uh, I, I think you'd still have a pretty strong case because you'd have you'd demonstrate that you acted with reasonable care relying on this uh, public official's statement. Uh, that said, my solution for a lot of these things is actually shaming the public official. So, no, I, I mean that that works with open records disputes a lot of the times. Just saying these criminal complaints are inaccurate. I bet they start to become more accurate after after that. I just wanted to give some advice on that. Last year I was here and somebody said they had the same problem with getting uh, uh, open records requests, having to constantly request it from the police. And what they did is they just continually did it until the police started just giving them the documents. So like if you were to, if you pester them enough, you might be able to change how they operate. And that might then solve this issue for you too. Yeah, that, and oftentimes, unfortunately, that's the only option that media have in these cases. I, I'll also say uh, state legislators often are very good because they know that you have readers uh, who uh, will have to vote on them, so they will often make a case out of it if you start writing stories about it. So that's often a less legal but much more PR-based way of doing things. Um, one other thing, and th this comes up oftentimes, um, I, I know some of you may have interns and uh, they might have an investigative project and they still are learning basically the principles of journalism. Everyone who's practiced journalism for long enough knows that if you're writing a story about someone, you contact them. I can't tell you the number of times that I'll be reviewing a big investigative piece and I say, okay, well, what did the subject say, oh, well, I'm not going to call them. That'll ruin it. And no, no, no. That's when I start to have heart problems. And um, you, you just can't do that. You've, you've got, and I mean, what I say is go to their home and leave a mess. If they're not picking up the phone, leave a note in the mailbox, email them, keep records of all of this, use fax machines uh, when I, if they still have them. Uh, where, for emails, I say, make it like 
an interrogatory, which is a long list of very specific questions, and have that in an email that's gone to them. And they, they'll probably ignore it, but if this were ever to be something that went to court, you would have such a stronger case because you took every step possible to get their side of the story. Uh, and that gets me to my next point, which is that if you're writing about a public figure or public official, they have to demonstrate, to succeed in a defamation lawsuit, they have to demonstrate that you acted with actual malice, which is either that you knew what you were writing was false or that you were recklessly disregarded the truth. So one of the key things with that is that you have a record of all of your times that you tried to contact them and that you basically laid all of your cards out on the table. I know that sometimes strategically doesn't always work, but whenever you can do that from a legal perspective, uh, please do. If it's a private figure, and the line is a little blurry be between public figures and private figures, but if it's a purely private figure, they don't have to demonstrate actual malice. Uh, so again, this is when you're doing like the police blotter, things like that. Um, they have a much lower standard, so be really, really careful when you're writing about someone who's not a government official or someone who's kind of known in your community. Uh, okay, this is, this is something that, yep. Is there kind of a blurred line sometimes between public and private citizens? How do you define a private citizen? We know what public officials are, but can it be a prominent citizen and still be a private citizen? How do, like, a, like a CEO of a company? A CEO of any sort of company of any uh, decent size will probably be a public figure. Um, but the line does get blurry and courts have gone like a sheriff's deputy. Some courts have said that's a public figure, some say it's a private figure. So I mean, elected officials are always gonna be public officials, uh, but I mean, it, so, so you, you can't always assume. I mean, I always say when in doubt, you have to assume that it's a private figure unless, unless it's really clear. Um, just please be careful about what you email to your colleagues. I cannot stress this enough. I talked about the actual amount I, I talked about the actual malice standard. Um, when you get sued, there's something called discovery where the other side can get all of your records that are relevant. And so if you have emails like this that say, this story is gonna destroy him, um, which I'm telling you, it is maybe not in those terms exactly, but things like that, uh, just pretend everything that you're writing could eventually be uh, made available to the person that you're writing about. Just a really quick question about that. When, when you're talking about email, does that also apply to, let's say, uh, other networks? So like an internal Facebook group or Slack yeah. or any sort of, I just want to make anything, sure. Anything, yeah. Anything written ever. Anything <laughs> written. Uh, talk face to face, talk on the phone. That is a lot less risky. Uh, along those lines, you really should develop a records retention policy which says, you know, six months after a story runs, six weeks, whatever, we'll purge the notes and we purge email after this long. Because you don't want, I mean, you need to have it as long as you need to have it, but you don't want notes that are unnecessary for years and years hanging around because those could be used against you. That said, if you suddenly write a story and you get a lawsuit threat, you can't then start purging your notes. That's actually a crime. So you don't want to do that. Uh, I know I'm running short on time, so I'll just finish the last two. Uh, consider media insurance. Now, most large media companies have insurance, so if they get sued, um, they can, they'll be indemnified at least in part. There are some insurers that are starting to go for, uh, have offerings for smaller sort of startup news outlets. Some are better than others. Uh, you really have to read the exclusions, uh, all sorts of the fine print really well. Uh, it could be worth it. I mean, the one example that I give is Gawker. Uh, I'll, I'll be the one media lawyer, that we talk about Gawker at every media law conference. Everyone says, well, I didn't like it. I'll admit, I read Gawker. Uh, it's not great journalism, but it was a news website that a lot of people read, and it is out of business. It was a pri privacy lawsuit, not defamation, but that's because they got a $140 million verdict against them. Um, 
you want insurance, uh, or you want to at least consider insurance and see if it's possible. Uh, and the final tip that I have is it's always better to deal with lawyers before your story runs. I cannot stress this enough. Uh, if you have a lawyer look over an investigative story even for an hour, that, will, that could prevent 200 hours of just responding to a complaint. Um, because lawyers do pre-publication review where they really go through and look for the red flags and can assess the risk. And they, again, can't prevent a lawsuit from being filed against you, can't even prevent you from necessarily losing, but can significantly reduce the risk and spot issues that are, com that are really common red flags that could, that could get you in a lot of trouble. So, um, so really, uh, the, the one thing that you have to do is have a lawyer on, basically have an agreement with a lawyer uh, where you basically have the attorney-client privilege locked in place. So if you need that lawyer at 9 p.m. on a Monday, you can call the lawyer and have them immediately work with you and then your communications are privileged with that lawyer. Yep. Sorry, this one's actually going back a couple steps, I think to like point six or so. What do you consider a reasonable deadline? To, you know, to ask for comment. It, it depends. I mean, I'll give you one example. The, actually, the story where I was threatened with being arrested for going uh, in Texas, um, that I had sent them uh, about 10 single space pages of questions. And um, we, we gave, we, and I actually talked with our lawyers about it, and we gave them a week. Because it would be ridiculous to say, by 5 PM today, respond to all of these questions. But, if it's just a few questions, um, you have to make sure they're actually getting it, and that's the trick. Uh, because you could send it to them, give them a few hours, and then the story runs, and they say, well, I didn't even get my email. So that, that's, that's what you have to balance. Okay, thanks very much. Should I hand it for Jeff? Thanks. All right, and I want to um, introduce a longtime supporter of Lion and a sponsor of the conference, Kenny Cascaro, is gonna come up and speak to us for a second. How many people use something different, like Google DFP, Ad Rotate, etc.? And how many people are just getting started? Still getting started? All right. So how many people kind of got started but are still trying to figure out their whole ad strategy? All right, guys. Yeah. So let's log in. I've only got a couple slides, and that's probably not even the most important part. So. Um, so Broadstreet is an ad server. It's an ad manager. Um, it's a replacement or a plugin for Google DFP. So that's at its core, that's what we do. We do the management, delivery of ads, and stuff like that. But the reason people actually use Broadstreet is because two things, our customer service is generally really good. So um, I can say that, but I think you can talk to the rest of our customers and say, hey, when I have a question or when you have a question, uh, does Broadstreet get back to you in time and uh, has the support? And I think usually it's, it's very positive. Number two, for those people who are still getting started, um, we put a lot of time and put a lot of thought into uh, help, helping our customers plan out their ad units. So they say, hey, you know what, I'm getting into this advertising thing, but I don't really know what I'm doing. I need help. That's what we're really good at. We're, we're good at getting help and bringing those ideas. All right, so some people who come from DFP and they come from other platforms, they come to us for the customer service and the help because it's really nice, all right, to have somebody in your corner of the ring. All right, somebody who's constantly thinking about what you're doing every day, which is going out and pitching new advertisers, um, doing the things that are actually going to make you successful in selling ads. Because Google DFP, they're not, you know, you upload the ads they run, they don't really care about whether you're making the sale. Only when you make the sale, you know, you go and use DFP. Broad Street, we think about everything you're doing. So once you get on Broad Street as a platform, just to show you very quickly what we do, we try to make advertising 
interesting again, because we are probably the only ad tech company in the entire world that will tell you that digital advertising is mostly garbage, all right? <laughs> this is the industry I, I'm in, it's just all crap. So we say, <laughs> so we say, how can we make it not crap, all right? How can we make it something that, I don't know, for the people who are selling batter ads right now, you walk into the sales conversation, and how confident are you if you're you know, trying to sell them at 300 by 250? It's hard to be excited if, or, or think that your advertiser's gonna be excited. I won't even take a sales call if I don't think I can show my, my potential clients something that they're gonna be excited about. It's hard to go in there with a 300 by 250 and think, this person's gonna say that. Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was on a roll. You can take um, that one Okay, all right, good idea. That's what it's for, right? I do. All right. <laughs> all right, so that's much better. So it's so hard to go into a, a sales conversation being confident about what you're selling. So this is what we try to do. We say, I had it on the first slide, impress, perform, renew. You want to impress the prospect with something they haven't seen before. If they haven't seen it before, they're going to start the conversation. All right, and it might get them to say yes. They might do a trial run, but the point is you've opened the door where they, they probably left that door shut on 10 other people, but you've got something different, and they're gonna, they might say yes to it. Then when you actually get the campaign to, to run, it actually performs, because it turns out when you're not selling garbage, the campaign performs. Everyone thinks that display advertising is dead because the performance is dim, dismal, and it is, and that's because it's all garbage. Nobody cares about 300 by 250s. They want something that they are genuinely interested in. So this is an example of something that we do. It's just one of like eight million ad formats that we have on our platform. Anybody who uses Broad Street knows that we have a lot of them. But this is an example, it's like a 300 by 600, it doesn't have to be that size, but it's an ad that if you guys uh, got the spam this morning, um, we announced in our, uh, in our newsletter, it was up there. Um, so it's an event listing ad. It dynamically pulls in a venue's events, right? So this thing you create, it takes like two seconds. You show it to the advertiser and you say, hey look, you're trying to sell tickets to something. You know, why don't we just automatically show the upcoming events at your venue? All right, this is just one of like 80 things we offer. All right, and it's been, it's been a pretty big seller with the performing arts centers. We've had a few customers using it recently. This is something we'll announce tomorrow, right? Really easy to create. There's a customer at newarkpulse.com um, we could just take a look at the page, but if you go there, NewarkPulse.com, or you could just Google Newark Pulse coupons, they have a page where, I mean, this is really just an image and text. They created like 30 of these things, got a bunch of small advertisers in the door, just really simple ways. And you know what? They requested this, and we built it for them. So like I said, we're constantly thinking about what you're doing, but also listening to your feedback. All right, we're constantly building. It, ultimately, Broad Street is a platform mostly developed by us, but inspired by the feedback of the customers that we've had. So these things perform, you know, pretty much five to, probably about three to five times the average banner ad. So all of a sudden it turns out it's not about targeting, it's not about reaching, you know, using machine learning or artificial intelligence to get the perfect, uh, you know, the perfect user to click on the ad. It turns out if you just sell something that isn't awful, it performs really well. So speaking of performance, the last part is renewal. You did, you know, you, you got the advertiser to even respond to your email or pick up the phone. You got them on board, you did all the hard work, you delivered a campaign that was awesome. Now you wanna wrap it up in a report that actually looks really good. Um, this is probably one of our most celebrated features is our reporting. So if we just take a quick look at this. All right, so this is Homepage Media Group. Uh, Kelly, I'm sure you guys know her. Um, so we take a look at their report. We'll give the views, the impressions, the clicks, the things you'd see with every other ad server. We'll also break it down by geography. There isn't, I think this only ran for a little while, so there's a few, um, only a few items on here. You can't really actually see the, um, the locations, but we'll actually say for every click, for every engagement, where did it come from? So you can prove that, okay, you ran a campaign, it actually, the people who engaged were from the geographical area that you were targeting. So this, is, again, was, uh, I think this is, a, this is a feature request by Scott at, air all now, um, it's just something that just became really popular and uh, very helpful for a lot of our clients. So we've had a lot of people say, the report is what got that customer back on board, or the report is what got them to renew, because no one else is doing something like this. So we also do newsletter advertising, Dave Walsh is going to talk a little bit about that um, in a bit. So, one thing I don't want you to do is leave this conference without knowing a little bit about what Broad Street does. So if you're interested or you need help, or you need that person in the corner of your ring, just talk to us. You know where to find us once the elevator doors open. Like, you look straight, we're right there. Um, if you want to set up a demo, 
in a raffle for a free pair of Ray-Bans. Uh, if you're already a customer, you want those Ray-Bans, introduce us to someone who you think might want to explore Broad Street. Or you could uh, email us a, you know, a testimonial or something like that, we'll throw you in the raffle too. Um, I think Dave already uh, popped the cork on this one. Um, we're doing mimosas tomorrow, I think around 11 a.m., so uh, we'll have that. So that is it, thank you for listening to my, my spiel. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference, thank you. All right, so we're running a little bit behind schedule. We're supposed to have a break, um, and we, we technically will, but if you want to stay, we're going to get started again in like five minutes. Um, and Jim Brady, uh, Ebony Reed, Heather Bryant, we've got some really good lightning talks coming right up.